won't get into the Schrodinger equation. It has to do with H, the Hamiltonian operator, um, and wave functions. Um, there, there's a lot going on in these, but what is really important for us is that Schrodinger did the math. Um, if you take physical chemistry, which is um, usually in your junior or senior year, if you're a chem or biochem major, excellent class, really exciting. However, um, the only thing we need to know is that when we plot a distance versus psi squared, it represents an orbital, a probability of where the electron will likely to be found. We'll dive into these a little bit more um, once we discuss the actual locations of where an electron could be. I say could because it's a probability. Um, quantum numbers. Quantum numbers are our solutions to the wave function. Now with quantum numbers, there are four main quantum numbers. We're gonna go over all of them individually and see how they are related to each other. But here are the main four. The principal quantum number, the most important one, that is N. That's the N that we were talking about before. It's an energy level. N is going to help us determine what orbital um, level we're at. N equals one, N equals two. We'll talk about that in just a second. The angular momentum quantum number is L. Uh, that tells us the orbital type. What's its shape? What does it look like? What's the probability distributional map look like when we plot out psi squared? Uh, the next one is the magnetic quantum number, M sub L is how it's uh, spoken, ML if you really want to forget the sub part, but it is a subscript for that little L. Um, and that tells you um, the position of the orbital on an XYZ plane. So if we think about the orbital type L and we put it now in a 3D Cartesian plane, how can we see the orientation take shape? And then the spin quantum number, ms, that's the orientation of the actual spin. This describes um, not technically what the orbital looks like, but the traveling of the actual electron. So let's just get into a couple of these um, more specifically. We'll start with the principal quantum number. I'll abbreviate quantum number qn. And the principal quantum number is that lowercase n. Um, again, this describes the size, the energy, of the orbital. Now, when we were talking before and we said, here's the nucleus, there's n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, those are the same principal quantum number that we are discussing. Now, the larger the n, n starts at one, two, three, all the way up to infinity, the larger the n, the further away it is from the nucleus. So what that means for us is that the energy will be greater. Um, when, we, when we think about increasing energy, as you move away, from the nucleus. This can be calculated. The energy at a specific energy level is equal to the negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n squared. Now, uh, that energy is negative because it's the electron um, and it's the interaction, the attraction between the electron and its uh, nucleus. Um, opposites attract. So that energy is negative, but that negative number will get smaller and smaller and smaller, closer to zero as we, as we move away. What we also see with this is that because it's n squared, as n increases, the energy difference between orbitals gets smaller. So the spacing between 
n equals 1 and n equals 2 is the biggest difference in energy or the biggest distance. As we get further and further away, if we were to plug in n equals 5 and n equals 6, that difference in energy is very, very small. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more uh, when we start to do our um, chapter 3 information with how does this relate to the actual electron itself um, in a specific element. All right, so n equals 1, 2, 3, 4. That's all you would really need to know right now. It's how it relates to the angular momentum quantum number that's important. Angular momentum quantum number. Again, L, it's a little scripty L. L is equal to zero, one, two, all the way up to N minus one. Now this is a range of possibilities. All we want to be able to say with these quantum numbers is does this position exist? Can we look at N, L, and ML and see a physical orbital in our electron cloud? So if N equals one, the only possibility I have for L is zero. If n equals 2, l could be 0 or l could be 1. It's the range always from 0 up to n minus 1. If n equals 2, l could equal 0, l could equal 1. Oh, excuse me, 3. I did 2. If n equals 3, L could be 0, 1, or 2. And the last one that we'll stop at, if n equals 4, L could be 0, L could be 1, L could be 2, or L could be 3. There are an infinite amount of possibilities with n, which means as we increase n, our options for L also increase. Now, quantum numbers are a very tricky subject. However, we do have um, a way of describing each one individually, but seeing how it's based off of the previous. Now, looking again at the zeros and the ones and stuff, that's difficult. So what we de decided as chemists is to give this angular, quant angular momentum quantum, no quantum number a, a more definitive letter denotion. Because this uh, quantum number is going to describe a shape, of an orbital. Um, we give the actual numeric value a letter. Zero is the s orbital. It's a sphere. I'm going to try the nice little shading on that sphere. Again, thankful that my parents told me, don't be an artist, go be a chemist instead. No, I still like to do art, but it's nice to have um, that be a hobby and not a job. Again, uh, no matter what the n is, if l is 0, that's the s orbital, which is still a sphere. The only difference between the n equals 1 s orbital and the n equals 2 s orbital is the size. Larger s versus a smaller s. We know large versus small because of the n value, the shape, the sphere, because of the l value. If l is 1, that's what we call a p orbital. A p orbital looks kind of like a figure 8. We'll do some shading on one side, usually a shaded side and an unshaded lobe there. So again, l equals 0, that's s. L equals 1, that's P. If L equals 2, that's the D orbital. These look like a clover, kind of like two P orbitals are kind of hugging. Again, shading on some of those lobes. L equals 0 is S. L equals 1 is P. 
L equals 2 is D. L equals 3 is the F orbital. I'll show you what the F orbitals look like. But again, the ones that I really want you to be able to recognize the shape for is the sphere and that figure 8 or the dumbbell shape for S and P. Lovely. Too far. Going to our third quantum number, the magnetic quantum number. That's the M sub L. This is going to describe our orientation on a 3D Cartesian plane. So it is described as the range of minus L to L plus L, including zero. Simplest one, if N equals one, L equals zero, ML equals zero. What that means is if I think of a 3D plane, X, Y, and Z, if I put a sphere there right in the middle, there's no way that I could rotate that sphere to make it look different. Think about rotating a ball. It's symmetrical, right? So there's only one orientation for that one S orbital. It's excellent. When N equals two and L equals zero, ML also equals zero. The two S orbital has one orientation. No amount of rotating that ball will make it look different. Now here's where we get difference. When N equals two and L equals one, the 2p orbital, if we plug in our options for ml, it's the range from minus l to plus l, including zero. That is three orientations. The minus one, the zero, and the plus one. Three values there, so three orientations. What that means for us is if we imagine the p orbitals on an x, y, z plane, I can actually imagine one of the p orbitals being along the x-axis. So it might get a little bit fuzzy. I'll zoom in. One of them being along the y-axis. And one of them being along the z-axis. Doesn't matter where your shading goes, it just makes it nice and pretty. This would be what we call the PZ. This is our PY. And there is our PX. The three orientations. Notice how because of that P shape, that dumbbell looking shape, the figure eight shape, we can imagine it rotating on the XYZ axis and looking different. Just to do a couple more. If n equals 3 and l equals 0, ml again equals 0. So the 3s orbital, again, it's a sphere, so the shape is dictating the orientation. n equals 3, l equals 1. The p orbital has an x, a y, and a z orientation. If n equals 3 and l equals 2, the d orbitals, a minus 2, a minus 1, a 0, a plus 1, and a plus 2. Five orientations. Yikes. And then let's just imagine our last option. If n equals four, let's just jump to l equals two for the, or l equals three for the f orbitals there. The f orbitals, minus three, all the way to plus three, including zero, seven orientations. Lovely. 
we'll be able to look at those images in just a second. I, I want to show you the um, positions in the sphere and the dumbbell and what the D's look like and the theoretical positions or shapes of the F orbitals. Again, all of these are mathematical probabilities. Um, so we can't see them with a microscope, but they are mathematically uh, driven. Um, the last one, last quantum number doesn't really describe the atomic orbital, just describes uh, the actual magnetic spin. Quantum number, M sub S. M sub S means that the, the actual electron could be a minus one half spin or a plus one half spin. We'll get into this one um, a little bit more in section three of chapter three. Right now, all you would need to be able to know for this is the actual values. Ms can either be minus one half or plus one half. It is unrelated to any other quantum number. So just like how L was related, was determined by N and ML was determined by L, Ms is independent of all of those other ones. It's just the fourth quantum number we need once we start building up our electron clouds with specific elements. Okay. Now, why we have these um, shapes and how the actual math works, I'm gonna just briefly identify and show you some pictures. Um, when psi squared uh, is determined, it's the probability density. Um, and the, it's the probability of finding an electron at a specific point in space around the, uh, the, um, the nucleus in the electron cloud. Now, most likely area to find the atom's electron um, as you decrease, uh, decreases as you move away from the, from the nucleus. Now, nodes are um, probabilities of zero. Uh, it's when the function says that there is not any likelihood that the electron is there. One very big node is the actual center where the nucleus is. Um, that the electron cannot be in the nucleus. That's not what we have determined for our electron atomic orbital. But we'll see in other shapes as we move away, um, there are more nodes. For instance, here's the probability density function for the s orbital. Notice how there's a whole bunch of dots. It's a whole bunch of just dots scattered around. And then it has some sort of radius right here when it gets to the lack of density around the outside. Um, the height of curve proportional to the probability density is psi squared. Um, and the density of dots proportional to the probability density tells us the shape. Notice how when we do the math, this does look like a sphere along our x, y, and z plane. Now, we don't need to do all of this, but this was where uh, the total or the distance um, from the nucleus was plotted based off of total, total radial probability. This is how we know the size of um, the actual s orbital or the 1s orbital, 52.9 um, picometers. So again, these are all calculated based off of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most easy to calculate using the Schrodinger equation um, because it has only one electron. Once you get up to more than one electron, things get a little bit crazy and you can't do it by hand anymore. Um, you have to use a supercomputer. And so that's what everything's been um, determined after that. But everything is based off of the hydrogen nucleus. Um, so I know some of you might be like, well, Harry, if it's just off of hydrogen, like that's not real science. This is the best we get, all right? So um, you can do the math for us if you want to. But um, all of these are just looking at them and saying, oh, look at that beautiful picture. What this tells you is that when you get into the 2s and 3s, as your n equals 2 and l equals 0, or n equals 3 and l equals 0, the only thing that changes is the size. But what also comes about are more nodes. Now, what are these nodes? There's a big node right here, and that happens to be the 1s orbital. And for n equals three, there are two nodes, the 1s orbital and the 2s orbital, which tells us one thing. These actual positions are unique. 
and you can't get any overlap with bigger orbitals. That's really important to know. Um, when L equals zero, we have the S orbital, right? The number of nodes is going to be determined by N minus one, so that's how we can calculate that. For the N equals one, there, uh, there is essentially no nodes except for the actual nucleus, right? The electron can't be there. But once we get bigger and bigger and bigger, N equals two, three, four, the number of nodes does increase, but the shape is still spherical. Here are the P's, the illustration of the three types of P's on the X, the Y, and the Z. There's your X axis, your Y axis, and your Z axis. Um, you don't need to know any of the radial distribution functions. It's just the shape itself and that probability scatter chart. Ooh, five types of D orbitals. We know that there are five types of D orbitals because there are five MLs, right? When uh, we have d orbitals, that's L equals two. And so ML is minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. Lovely. Here they are. Aren't they pretty? You do not need to know these at all. You do need to know that there are, when L equals two, that's a d orbital, and that there are five orientations for those d orbitals. Um, but they're highly complex. So you would not need to draw these ones. F orbitals. These exist um, only in very specific circumstances. If you are an inorganic um, chemist, which I am not, uh, you spend a lot of time in the F orbitals. We'll see where they are um, in terms of on the periodic table, what elements have these. Uh, they're rather large elements. The lanthanides and actinide series is known for being um, their uh, outermost electrons are in the F orbitals. So those are the reactivities and people who do those. I had a very good friend in grad school who uh, is now a professor at uh, USC who deals with um, lanthanide catalysts. And so she deals with a lot of the uh, F orbital experimentation type things. Um, the phase of an orbital, why I shaded some things and didn't shade the other, comes with um, identifying the, the actual phase of the orbital, and those are mathematical wave functions. You do not need to know that. Um, that would be way, way advanced organic chemistry. All right, so thank you very much. This concludes our discussion of chapter two. Um, we'll practice quantum numbers and being able to determine the relationships between N, L, N, L, and then and S um, as we move forward. Um, we will continue with these quantum numbers in chapter three. So make sure that they are not something that you just drop off and say, oh, they'll disappear. They will never disappear, ever, ever, ever. So please make sure that you learn to love them now. Thank you very much. I'll see you in class.